Okay. A man once approached a speaker and said to him, You Christians are all brainwashed. And the speaker replied, I think we're all brainwashed to a degree. The important thing is what we as Christians choose what to wash our brains with. I thought it was a good answer. Today I want to look at the value of wisdom. Wisdom is something that I feel we've stopped valuing in our culture. I remember when I was younger, even in church, hearing the word wisdom more often. It was something we valued more. But we've stopped valuing it in our culture. And I think in some ways that's coming into our churches a little bit. The Bible holds wisdom up as one of the most valuable things we can ever chase after. Wisdom, biblically speaking, is essential to the Christian life. And we are exhorted in Scripture to ask for it, to seek it, to obtain it, to desire it, to use it. And there are many reasons for that, but I would like to just look at Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, this New Testament verse real quick that gives us kind of a reason why we need to hold wisdom up high. This is what it calls Christians to have. It says to be wise. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Because the day, days are evil, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I thought that was very good. Why do we need wisdom in our day? Well, because the days are evil. They're evil. And we need to know and understand what the will of God is. And so the days we live in are evil. There are dangers on all sides, dangers that seek to destroy the soul of a person. Lies and deceptions and perversions of justice that look to strip us of God. Things that hurt us. And in our relationship with our Father in heaven. Without wisdom, we will surely fall to the devil and his schemes. And there is no doubt that wisdom is not just about being knowledgeable, but it is also has to do with being godly. There's this connection in Scripture where wisdom says it's not just about having head knowledge. There's something that's connected to God, and it's very important. Spurgeon said, wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know it is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There's no fool so great as a fool as a knowing fool. And indeed, being wise has much to do with our souls. And this is the thing that I hope we can understand. It has a lot to do with our souls. The fool says in their heart, there is no God. The fool says in their heart, there is no God. That's what the scriptures tell us here in Proverbs. So what does the wise man say? The wise man says, there is a God. And that means I'm accountable to that God. That means that there is truth. That means that there is such a thing as ultimate good. That means that I am a sinner. That means that I need a savior. Wisdom is not just knowledge, but also godly insight into how to use it. Wisdom walks us down paths of truth and righteousness. And so the unwise person will fall into traps, will fall into wickedness, will indulge in evil desires. The unwise person will be swayed by the world and the culture, will be enticed by fools whose lips drip honey. The unwise person will fall prey to their own passions and emotions. The unwise person will not learn from their mistakes. The unwise person runs the risk of being cut off with the rest of the wicked. And we're going to see that spoken of here in a moment. What I'm trying to say is that there is a reason that the Bible greatly values wisdom. It's not just nice to have. It's not just making your life nicer. It points us to the one who gives wisdom, who is God. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. We see many fools today in the world spouting foolish things. And what the church needs to be in our day, what we need to be in our evil day is wise. Why is it that we don't follow in the same paths? Why is it that we don't trip up and fall in the same holes and break our spiritual leg, as it were? What Christians need to be are wise. And I want to take a moment today to turn our eyes to Proverbs and encourage us to seek it and to help you posture yourself in such a way to obtain it. And that's the beauty of this passage. It helps us to understand what does it take? What, is it, what do we have to be? Where do we have to posture ourselves in order to gain wisdom? So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn them uh, to Proverbs chapter 2. 
Proverbs chapter 2. And as you turn there, Proverbs chapter 2, I just want to give a quick tutorial about Proverbs. Proverbs is, of course, uh, a wisdom, it's called wisdom literature. That's the genre of the writing. It's wisdom literature. It's trying to impart wisdom to us. Um, it was written, of course, by uh, Solomon, and he was writing much of it to his children, trying to impart wisdom to his kids. It's really quite a neat uh, context. Now, the way you read wisdom literature is important. Some people think that you should go read Proverbs like this. A plus B will equal C. If I do this, then I'm guaranteed this outcome. But that is the wrong way to read it. Rather, if Proverbs says, for instance, raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they're older, they will not uh, depart from it, uh, it is not a guarantee, but it is wisdom. Generally speaking, this is the case, meaning that if you do that, it is likely that this will be the outcome. Disciple your kids well, they will likely be disciples. If I aim at something, I'm likely to hit it. If I work hard, I will more likely do well in life. If I'm not lazy but observe the ant and am diligent, then good things are likely to come from it. In wisdom, we live under wise principles, and those wise principles often result in good outcomes. And wisdom even tells us what to do when those outcomes do not come about as hoped. So read it as wisdom to live by. Read it as something that will generally be true as we walk through this world. And so we come to Proverbs today, as I said, written by Solomon. What did Solomon ask for as the, the thing that God should give him? Wisdom. Wisdom. God gave Solomon wisdom. And even Solomon, like the rest of us, failed often in his wisdom. So there's something to be said about wisdom's only as good as far as we apply it and use it. <laughs> and so, how to obtain it? where it comes from, what the results are when we do. Okay, this is what I want us to look at. How do we obtain wisdom? Where does it come from? And what is the results uh, when we do? Let me start today by simply reading the first four verses of Proverbs chapter 2. Here's what the word of the Lord says. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding... Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you speak it or seek it, sorry, like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures. Stop there. Now you may not know it, but in those first four verses, we are told the conditions for developing wisdom. You may ask, how do I get wisdom? How do I become wiser? In what way can I obtain it? These first four verses give us plenty to answer that question. So here we see four conditions for developing wisdom. Number one, acceptance of wisdom. Acceptance of wisdom. Solomon says in verse one, he says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commands within you. There's something to be said about being willing to receive wisdom. I think it is one of the most frustrating things as a parent, as it may have been here with Solomon, as this is addressed to his kids, when you desire to give wisdom to your children and you desire to tell them something and they don't necessarily want to listen to it. Yeah, dad, what do you know? What do you know about being a teenager anyways? It's like, it takes effort, doesn't it, to get kids, our kids to receive wisdom. It takes effort for them to value what you're saying to them out of the experience that God has lived in you. But are you and I any different, is the question. Do you ever stop long enough to read the word, listen to a sermon, actually receive the wisdom being taught from it? Some of us here today are, oh, when's he going to be done? We kind of go into this mode. There are many reasons we will not receive. It can be because we don't think it's valuable, it can be because of our pride where we think we don't need it or that doesn't apply to me. There are so many times where we shut off the words of the Lord because we don't think it applies to our lives. And so the first step in developing wisdom is this willingness to receive it. I have to come with a willingness to receive wisdom. I know it sounds like a simple point, but it's not so simple in the flesh. 
We need to be willing to take the time to actually sit ourselves in front of wisdom, wisdom from God, wisdom from His Word. We have to spend more than five minutes in the Scriptures. We actually need to study it and understand it and apply it. That is what receiving means. We intentionally take it in. And this is the, the, the verse goes on to say that we receive and treasure up the commands. Treasure up the commands. Do you know what if, that if you look at the, the word here in the Hebrew, it insinuates the idea of hiding something valuable within. Hiding something of value within yourself. The King James, in fact, makes that point in how it translates it. If you have a King James, you'll see that hidden, this hidden idea. Psalm 119.11 says what? I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's something about bringing it inward. We're receiving it in. And so how do we treasure up God's word? One of those ways is we memorize the words of God. That's one way that we treasure his word. We memorize it to the heart. We receive that wisdom. You know, we have these kids that are going to be coming into our church and doing Bible quizzing here, and they're memorizing the word of God. Our prayer is that that would come into their heart, and that as they grow up, it would become wisdom to them, that truth would, would abide in them. And so it comes into us like treasure. It shapes us. It forms us. It renews our minds so we do not conform to the patterns of this world, but are rather transformed. And so when God speaks, accept the wisdom. Treasure it up within yourself. Tuck it away in your heart. That is the first step of gaining wisdom. It's kind of like when Mary said she took those things that were said to her and she treasured them up in her heart. Once when I was at a conference with the great preacher Vodi Bauckham, he talked about taking his son to a meeting of older Christian men. And before he entered the room, he said to his son, he's a big black guy, and he said, now son, if you keep your mouth shut and listen, you may learn a thing or two. And so in the same way, when God's word is before us, let us be quiet and listen and receive the treasure that he has for us. Amen? So accept or receive wisdom is the first condition. Don't be a fool and despise wisdom. Don't be a fool and ignore wisdom. Receive it when it comes. Number two, submit to wisdom. Verse two says, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. So the idea of inclining your heart uh, uh, to the matter is a matter of submission. It means I will move my heart close to it. I will open myself up to it. My heart will submit itself to what is being said. So Solomon here is calling his children to receive and incline their hearts towards that wisdom. There is a sense of a willing, wholehearted compliance to what's coming. You know wisdom is only wisdom for those who use it. If you submit to it, and this is part of the submission, if you submit to it, you can hear wise things all day. But if you do not submit to it and put it into practice then do not expect to be changed or helped by it. It's no longer wisdom to you if you do not submit to that wisdom. So when we come under the word of God and the truth and the wisdom and the knowledge that he gives us, we each and every time, every one of us has a decision to make. Will I do something with this? Will I obey it? Will I actually go from this place and put it into practice, right? Will I do anything with this? Will I submit to what God has said in his wisdom? Many of us come to church or read a devotional or pick up our Bibles and after hearing what God has said, we'll do nothing to change. We'll respond with nothing afterwards. That is a sure sign that you've not inclined your heart towards that truth. You've not inclined yourself towards. You have not inclined your heart towards wisdom. You've not submitted to that wisdom. And without that inclining of your heart, you'll never gain that wisdom. So we accept wisdom and we submit to wisdom. The third uh, condition for developing wisdom is humility. Humility. Verse 3 says, If you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, there is something important about being humble enough to say, I don't, not, I, I don't know. I do not know. I'm a fool who needs wisdom. There was a song growing up from Delirious. It's called King of Fools. I can't remember the words, but it's been on my mind as I've been going through this topic. I'll live for you, and I'll try to be the king of fools. The idea being, I, I'm, I'm a foolish man walking before the Lord, and I need his wisdom. We call out for wisdom. I have a lot to learn. So in humility, we call out for help. 
Do not be wise in your own eyes. Pride says, I don't need it. I know. Or I'll figure it out. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to listen to that sermon. I don't have to read books. I don't have to listen to advice. That person remains foolish. They are stunted in their spiritual growth by that. But the humble person calls out for wisdom, it says. Raises their voice and asks for someone to please come and give them wisdom. So God says in his word, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask for God to give it to you. That does not mean just in a sudden supernatural way, like a download. That can mean that. But it also means that he teaches us through his word, through experience, and yes, even through failures. Failing is a great way to learn wisdom if you'll learn from it when it happens. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. So if you want wisdom, humble yourself and know that God knows more than you and I. Then you don't have all the, that you don't have all the answers and you ask for him to give you wisdom. It takes humility to ask for advice. And it's no different with God. If you don't know, ask Ask God, go to his word, ask pastors and teachers, seek wisdom from godly people who are older in the faith. Be humble, call out for wisdom and humility. And finally, number four, desire wisdom. Desire wisdom. Do you desire wisdom? This is the thing I I was saying at the start. It seems like when I was younger, there was more of a culture of desiring wisdom. And we would look to those in the church who had it. Because we saw the value. Do you desire wisdom? And if not, why? In verse 4, we're told, Seek it like silver and search for it as hidden treasures. Just consider that. Solomon had everything he ever could have wanted. Everything he ever could have wanted. Women. He had all the women he ever wanted. He had money. He had palaces. He had a kingdom. And he says, This is better. This is better than all that. Solomon's saying that we should desire and seek wisdom as much as we seek silver and hidden treasures. If I said to you and convinced you that right now, before you, when you came to the service, I quickly ran home and I dug a hole in your backyard and I put a big pile of buried treasure back there. And then I said, and then, and then we ended the service, would you run home to dig it up and say, there, I found it. Would you start digging holes in your backyard looking for it? But if I said to you, go home and read this passage and search out its wisdom, would would you likely bother? Would you bother to go home and start digging? You and I have failed to grasp the value of wisdom. We have failed to see the benefit. We have stopped believing that it's worth our time and our effort, and that is a shame. We've cut ourselves off at the spiritual knees and robbed our souls of precious nourishment. We've taken God by the rejection of, of godly wisdom, and we have made him less in our life, and we've devalued wisdom. And it's really our sinful nature that really makes us fools. It's our sinful nature that has caused us to desire gold more than wisdom and to remain a fool rather than to become wise. Jesus says in Matthew 13, 44, in the parable of the kingdom, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he did it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had, and he bought that field. Wisdom from God is like that. It's valuable beyond measure because wisdom is directly connected to God. We value the words of the ones we love. How much then should we value God's word and his wisdom because of how much we actually value and love him? And that's the next point that Solomon makes to us in Proverbs. So we've talked about what are the conditions that we put ourselves in in order to receive wisdom. But what now are the results of meeting those conditions for developing wisdom? So after we've accepted wisdom, submitted to wisdom, become humble before wisdom, desire wisdom, he says in verses 5 to 11, we're going to read that together, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the ways of his saints. 
Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. This is the result of putting ourselves in a posture to receive wisdom. Now, I wish we could cover all this in detail, but let me just summarize what he says here are the results of posturing yourself in this way towards wisdom. You will gain wisdom, first of all, in your relationship with God. In your relationship with God. Solomon says that if you receive, submit, humble yourselves, desire wisdom, the posture, and posture yourself in the way to obtain wisdom, then you'll understand, it says, the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. You'll find knowledge of God, knowledge you didn't previously have, insights you didn't know you had before. There's something important to know here. We can know nothing apart from God. That is the essence of this. Nothing makes sense. And I mean nothing. Nothing makes sense. I don't know how to say this. I feel like my words couldn't grasp what I'm about to say. Nothing in this world makes sense apart from God. Nothing. Nothing has meaning. The source of all wisdom is from God. Verse 6 clearly tells us that the Lord gives wisdom. It comes from his mouth. Understanding can only be found in him. I have been intrigued lately by something called presuppositional apologetics. Now, apologetics is the giving of an answer or a defense for what we believe, okay? And so presuppositional apologetics is interesting because it presupposes that we cannot even enter into the act of having a logical, meaningful conversation without the existence and knowledge of God. We can't even enter into the act of having a conversation without the existence and knowledge of God. Where did we get the ability to reason? To declare something good or bad? True or not true? Where did we gain the understanding that there's knowledge that we can put in, into order and have a coherent, meaningful thought or conversation? It is because there is a God who created all things, gave meaning to things, has created the laws that govern all things, including reasoning skills. There is something called objective truth because of God. And so we cannot make sense of or know anything rightly without first accepting that there is a God. So every time the atheist begins to argue rationally for something, they're stealing from the Christian worldview. They're stealing from us every time they enter into that that, uh, order of things. So in that sense, they've already lost the debate. The debate's over. Every time they claim something to be good or evil or moral or immoral, they're stealing from the Christian worldview, period. Because there is no morality without God that matters. We can make it up. We can subjectively just develop it according to what we think. But it has no actual inherent meaning. So the same is true with you. You cannot hope to know anything meaningfully or can you hope to have a proper identity of yourself without first acknowledging who created you and made you in his image. And so posturing ourselves towards God in such a way as to receive from him wisdom increases our knowledge of who he is and who we are. It says, then you'll understand. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord. That's verse 5, right? In our world, as people reject God, we see them slowly losing understanding of both who he is And what he has designed in this world. Our world is quickly becoming more foolish all the time. And it's because they've not inclined their hearts to the one who gives wisdom. They've not inclined their hearts to the one who gives wisdom. This week, the city of Red Deer has made it legal for women to go topless at public swimming pools. Yeah. Did you know that? Foolish. It's foolish. It has no age limit. So it can be, include teenagers. And it does not matter who's there. There's no protecting men in their weakness in their eyes. No protecting women from predators. No protecting young boys or children from it. And it all comes from this ide- ideology where men can be women and women can be men. And thus it's a violation of the Human Rights Act of Canada to say to a woman who identifies as a man that they have to please cover up their breasts. That is what happens When we reject God, wisdom goes out the window and we become fools. 
and we can no longer make sense or can make meaning out of anything. It all becomes subjective. Verse 7 even says it. When we know God and who He is, then we'll know righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. Why? Because all morality finds its basis in the character of God. All morality finds its basis in the character of God. Remove Him and anything goes. Anything can go. And we're quickly heading in that direction as a culture. If we have Him, then we simply need to look at Him and His character and see what is good and right and just. So let's not forget here that it also says, finally, that more than just morality and goodness and sense, when we seek wisdom from God, God says in verse 7 that He will shield us. He will guard us, that his knowledge will be pleasant for our souls. In verse 10, and in verse 11, that understanding and discretion will watch over you. This is what happens. Our life, our soul will be guarded from the pitfalls of sin and ruin. Wisdom helps us to know God and know self. And from that, our souls are cared for. You can't really love yourself until you understand your identity in Christ. You'll always question your value, your worth, who you are what you're supposed to be about, who you are. So the first result of meeting the conditions of wisdom is gaining wisdom in our relationship with God and the outpouring of that, how all things start to come together and make sense. And so it's kind of hard to watch our culture and our politicians argue about truths that they don't have any foundation for. Is it any surprise when they say, we can just go this way? And somebody goes, can you? Yeah, we're going to go that way. And there's no guiding principle. The second result of meeting the conditions of wisdom is wisdom in relationship to others. Wisdom in relationship to others. And that's verses 12 to 15. It says, let's read it, verses 12 to 15. Delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. And so wisdom from God delivers us, it says, from evil men, and I I will say ourselves as well, our own evil way. Perverted speech, deception, in other words, delivers us from walking with them and being like them. It delivers us from evil and crooked paths. What does this look like? Well, there are many ways this plays out in our lives, but it can simply be called, let's say, the world. When the Bible talks about the world, it's that thing that is not of the kingdom of God. It's opposed to God. The things we watch, the things we listen to, the things we partake in, all the ways it's dragging us in that same behavior. The booze, the drugs, the porn, the unkind words, the gossip, the pride, the chasing after money and idols of many kinds. What wisdom does is it protects your soul from these things taking you down. It helps you identify when evil is in front of you and when you ought to turn away from it. It warns you. It puts up guards. And when the slick-tongued evil men want to call you to join them in their works, it guards you. It guards us from false teachers and those who would call themselves teachers of God but are really spewing lies of the evil one. And so wisdom guards the church. It guards us from evil and from evil doctrines, and evil men, and the wisdom guards us from our own sinful desires. As you become wiser, you become more knowledgeable of who you are, and the things that you are weak in, and the sins that you do. Proverbs 8.13 says, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. So if fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then that that same fear of the Lord moves us to to wisdom, and that wisdom learns to hate that which is evil, and thus you are delivered and guarded from repeating it. I think most of us would say, we've done things in our life we regret. I've gained wisdom from that experience. I know what to look out for. I know how I got myself into that mess. I know exactly what I need to do. So wisdom tells you, what you should and should not be doing because you know where it leads. Wisdom gives you defense. Wisdom tells you how to discern if something is from God or not. Wisdom tells you if it's God's will. Wisdom guards our eternal direction. And the same is said in verses 16 to 19. I'll just read that as well. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, 
from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsake the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. It's interesting because, again, this is Solomon talking to his sons. And this was a man, Solomon, who had, what was it, hundreds of concubines and women? And he's speaking from experience. And he's saying to his sons, don't do what I did. Don't go where I go. Don't break covenant with your God. Don't fall for the adulterous person. Don't fall for the adulterous woman. Be careful and guard your heart. Even Jesus said that if we look with lust, we commit adultery in our heart. So don't write this off as this is somebody else. This is all of us. Wisdom from God delivers us from the danger as well. We guard our eyes and protect our hearts. And in wisdom, we pursue Christ as our highest desire, our greatest love, so that the love we have for Jesus will overwhelm and push out the love we have for our sin. And so the result of meeting the conditions of developing wisdom is to be delivered from these sorts of follies. We're guarded by God from painful, destructive, sometimes soul-killing, soul-scarring sins that we as fools commit. Wisdom is more than just helpful. It clings us to God and it guards our souls from evil. And this is the last point for today. Wisdom is a necessary companion on our journey to glory. You know, the last verse is 20, uh, 20 says, If you will walk in the way of the good and keep to the paths of the righteousness. So as we journey towards glory, the deliverance from evil people makes room for you to walk with good people and in paths of righteousness rather than wickedness. It's a good path. It's a narrow path, but it's the only path that leads to heaven as the Bible tells us, right? Narrow is the path that leads to heaven. It's God's path. Few will find it, it says. The wisdom that we get is from the Holy Spirit. It is to put our hope in Christ alone for our salvation. The road we walk is a road paved by God and it leads to life. And as verse 21 through 22 says, for the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. So there is no doubt that Solomon is telling us something about the value of wisdom here. Wisdom will tell you who the sinner is, which is us, each one of us. Wisdom will also tell you who the Savior is. The value of wisdom is to know God and His benefits. Wisdom is to see God and to walk in a way that pleases Him and guards your soul. So wisdom is more than intelligence. Wisdom is to know God and to know what He requires of me. What is the value of wisdom? It is the value of walking with God. And is there anything greater than that? Is there anything more important than that? The value of walking with God every day. Do you know on our YouTube channel, back in Genesis, when we preached on Enoch walked with God, I'm surprised to see that it's the one video that has one of the, some of the most views out of all our videos on there. And it's always surprised me. And obviously people want to know what it means to walk with God. And so wisdom, it is the value of walking with God. So may you and I seek wisdom. May we value wisdom. May we receive it. May we submit to it. May we humble ourselves before it and desire it. May we be in a place where we want to become wise. And we're not wise in our own eyes. The minute we say we're wise, we are fools. But we want to pursue wisdom because we always want to be growing and become wiser. I don't know about you, but I always want to be able to have a wiser answer and to live a wiser life for the Lord's sake. And I want to have answers for people who don't know the Lord, who need to know the Lord. And so do all these things because we desire God. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Seek after wisdom, value wisdom because we desire God. Okay? I want to end with this. This week, there was a young lady and she was posted online in a short video. And it showed her coming apart at a bar in an airport somewhere in the States. She was being arrested, 
She started kicking and screaming, spitting on the police officers as they tried to detain her. And the things she was saying and doing made me really sad for her because it was apparent she wasn't just inebriated. She was a very broken person. She was going through a bit of a mental breakdown. Um, she was in trouble. Um, she was emotional, of course, and she was having this total mental breakdown. Her whole person was coming apart. So later I learned that she was a singer-songwriter. And I looked at her profile and she had a video about a song called Stardust. And as she unpacked her explanation about that song that she wrote, she said, I recently left religion. I've come to realize that we're just stardust. We have no meaning. We are to do what we want and be free to be who we are. We are just stardust. So this poor girl, and I mean this, I felt for her. This poor girl had in her foolish heart reduced herself down to nothing but stardust. Not a person of value made in the image of God, but stardust. And I believe that this poor girl's soul was crushed under that lie. Dear ones, may you and I seek wisdom like fine silver and treasure. May we incline our hearts towards the wisdom of God so that we may know the incredible love and salvation and good and true things of God, the life-giving way of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we seek wisdom for that reason. Because if we are fools and we say in our heart that there is no God, it's destructive to our soul and it will de degrade us and break us down till we cannot handle it anymore. So let's seek wisdom together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.